Hi, I'm Brian Grisco, and this is an essay entitled Last Christmas, written after Dylan Thomas, but with a flavor of Truman Capote and Gene Shepard as well. Each year I'd grow 12 months taller, but as a child, Christmas never changed. On a Saturday afternoon in early November, when the crisp leaves soared like phoenix feathers upon the gales, Mom removed the calendar from the fridge where it hung by a magnetic clip, out of sight and largely ignored. But now, at this, the ass end of the year, its empty boxes whispered glorious promises. Mom sat at the kitchen table, a steaming cup of sandalwood-colored tea close at hand, and filled those squares with her curly Catholic school script, weekend by weekend, starting with Thanksgiving. In our home, Thanksgiving was a thing of face-stuffing, belt-loosening, gas-inducing, cramp-spasming decadence, made doubly so because we didn't only center it around the lavish dinner, we bookended it with feasts. The night before, my thick-fingered father built a fortress of crusty bread slices and a glass baking dish, each dredged in a mortar of egg, cream, cinnamon, and Grand Marnier. He piled plates atop this doughy edifice to weigh it down, then stowed it in the fridge to steep till morning. I awoke to the rich aroma of this pudding in the air, wafting from the kitchen along with the cinder smell of strong black coffee and the natter of gossiping grown-ups. Still in flannel PJs, I headed downstairs to greet our guests. From as soon as I could hold a bottle, I played bartender, and by the age of 16, I'd poured a legion of mimosas. Uncle Joe would see my inquiring brows and say, Oh, hon, do you even need to ask? In his tar-scarred voice. Eyes bleary and bloodshot, he slumped at the kitchen counter in front of a heaping ashtray, fingers as ragged and yellow as the once cream sweater which stretched across his broad belly. Anytime his family gathered for a holiday, Uncle Joe required a constant drink, and countless cigarettes. His family, not our family, not this family. Uncle Joe wasn't really my uncle, but my dad's best friend, and his mother wasn't really my grandmother, though I called her grandmom, and saw her more frequently than my actual grandmothers, and in many ways cared for her more too. Once, while teaching me needlepoint, she loved the craft. She told me I had artistic hands, one of the nicest compliments I received as a child and one I worked hard to own. After passing her a mimosa, I watched as she surveyed the dining room table and, after a held breath moment of suspense, delivered her verdict. Exceptional work, Brian. Arranging the table was my job, and I did it with anal retentive gusto. In latter years, making unique name cards for each guest drawn or painted in a style I felt symbolic of their personality. Flowers and calligraphy for mom, a Paul Clay style abstraction for Uncle Joe, himself an artist, though he rarely painted since leaving his studio apartment in Philadelphia and returning to his childhood suburban cottage to care for his aging mother. A few times I made small gifts, glass bottles of vinegar suffused with herbs, hand-sized baskets full of flowers I dried from the basement rafters, botanicals picked from my parents' backyard garden. I worked months in advance on these in anticipation of the holidays. Making little things was what I did for fun in middle and high school. Making little things, doodling, daydreaming, wasting time. Aunt Cindy, another adopted family member, whom we called Aunt Chooch, Italian for jackass, a nickname so old I still don't know how exactly it originated, had at least one mimosa as well, though on many Thanksgivings she'd down several and stay the day with us, doing the breakfast dishes with scalding hot water and no gloves so that we joked she had asbestos hands. But cleaning came later. First, there were glasses raised to toast and bread casserole and mugs of French roast and crispy fried bacon and frittata and bagels too, everything shades of brown and beige, but the fruit salad, which my mom loaded with half-cut grapes, soused with booze, so that even as a kid by the end of the meal I had, like dad used to say, half a load on. 
As the plates and glasses emptied, the room filled with laughter, and there was a sense that we'd stay there all day if we could, if not for the turkeys to roast and stuffing to make and yeast rolls which required time to rise, chores tied to the obligations of biological family, in all cases a group not nearly as raucous and relaxed as this adopted one. Then Dad piled us into the car with the dog to walk off our full bellies on the long gray ribbon of road hugging the Schuylkill River. Though often Mom stayed home because she didn't like trekking in the cold, and Thanksgiving in Philadelphia bellows and blusters. Next came those weird hours, with great flurries of preparation, chopping and ripping, dicing, salting and braising, roasting, rubbing with butter and herbs, followed by long periods of waiting. And though I knew very little about the mechanics of cooking, I knew that it was essential everything came out on time, still hot, and that the turkey didn't dry out. How could this not be known? My dad broadcast his anxiety about the meal's intricate clockwork in sharp tones and sharper gestures as he walked the path and the carpet between the couch and the oven, my mother in tow, curlers and hair, wringing her hands. No matter how the meat came out of the oven, in my mouth it had a kind of sandy quality, though maybe that was the taste of stress. I loved that breakfast so much. For me, Thanksgiving could end when Santa rolled into town at noon. Santa's arrival signaled the start of Christmas music, which would be as omnipresent as the air we breathed for the next month or so, echoing from walls festooned with decorations. On a Sunday afternoon, not long after the reindeer hooves touched down on Broadway, Dad entered the closet that bridged my bedroom and my parents' bedroom, a passageway that scared me with its shadows and the murmurs of arguments I sometimes overheard as my parents dressed for work in the morning. He placed an aluminum ladder among the racks of clothes, then climbed up to open a trap door in the ceiling. A couple times I ascended with him into the attic, crouching low to avoid the beams of the roof, but this too frightened me. The space stretched long and dark into the house adjoining ours and was full of insulation that would itch your hands if you touched it, and nails hanging sharp and hungry not far from our heads, and sometimes evidence of mice, which I thought might carry rabies, a disease that, if they didn't put you down for, like old yeller, they treat with a huge needle to your ass. I much preferred staying at the ladder's foot, gazing into the black hole where once there was a ceiling, it was like another world opened above our own, a portal to a holiday afterlife. One by one, my father, strong as Hercules in the firmament, would hand it down boxes of ornaments and decorations single-handed, which my brother and mother and I lugged. Arms burning, fingers straining for purchase, mouth full of wine, down two flights to the basement, fire brigade style. It would be decades before my parents realized they could reorganize the cellar and store the boxes there and avoid this whole attic ringmarole. But as a child, it was habit, a small price to pay for making the house Christmas. The living room furniture would be reorganized too to accommodate the large square piece of plywood my dad laid in the corner for the tree and train, the couch and television switching sides, a chair moving, the familiar made strange. In my room, I covered my bureau with tissue paper, and though it took hours, assembled a Victorian village of thin, glossy pieces of cardboard. Where this paper village came from, I don't know. It was a place out of time, a Dickensian fantasia of women with fur muffs and ankle-length fur green dresses and ladder-hugging lamp lighters with fiery wicks in hand, and a daisy chain of ice skaters on the glassy pond, each and every one of them beaming white cheeks ruddy with yuletide. Even the street urchins looked content. There was a bakery done up with pink gingerbread siding and trim, cookies cooling in the windows, a weather toy store with a steam train for sale, a church for that dreaded obligatory holiday ritual, the celebration of mass, and around it all a rainbow string of lights that cast shadows of myriad size and color upon my wall. My fantasy figures in Star Wars, Wars toys retreated from the shelves, and in marched a battalion of nutcrackers, their military might cut by several jolly Santa figurines, 
with at least one ceramic snowman, like a fat general, calling the shots from behind the lines, his voice thick with corncob pipe smoke, a glacial Winston Churchill of the North Pole. A plastic candelabra replaced my bedside lamp with red and blue lights that were fun to read by, if somewhat squint-inducing. Next to that went a small wooden grandfather clock, in which a mouse carried a present to lay in front of an even smaller grandfather clock, a fractalish scene that, in the purple glow before sleep, I imagined could go on forever. Mouse upon mouse, clock inside clock, world without end. Amen. My brother had a paper village too, but it was of gingerbread men and women, an even trippier fantasy, and one that for years seemed second rate, maybe because there were fewer pieces and it appeared geared toward littler kids, and which he assembled with great teeth gnashing and numerous moans about fairness. As I got older, I didn't mind switching with him, as this entire season was one for dreaming. We had an old jacket of Christmas songs from 1973 called Ronco Presents a Christmas Present. The album itself long gone, but when you opened the jacket, a winter wonderland popped up before you. Ornaments studded evergreens surrounded Santa's cottage, before which elves loaded the sleigh with packages, while old Saint Nick himself rechecked his list. This artifact epitomized the feeling of the season. It was ancient, from before my time, a time when my parents were mysteries to me. And it was special and intricate and beautiful, and schmaltzy, and big, big in a way that it felt like we couldn't be the rest of the year, brimming with imagination and song. And if there were secrets at Christmas time, they were special secrets involving gifts, and any surprise births were holy ones, heralded by angels and kings. Ours was a particular kind of holiday fantasy, one I didn't understand then, one rooted in white, heterosexual, middle-class, 1950s Americana, though it came even more specifically from my mother's past. As a girl, her father was an alcoholic and a Catholic, devotions to which he attended with equal passion and guilt. The holidays were a dry time for him, a period of self-control to honor the crest child. And mom wanted this sense of lapse, of peace, of uncanniness. The black and white world turned colorfully topsy-turvy as if seen in the twisted fish-eyed reflection of a golden Christmas ball for her children, too. My father, who never had a stocking or many presents, and who in later years described his mother as evil and sadistic, a grim figure out of fairy tales, a wicked kitchen tyrant who broke wooden spoons on the back of her children and played them against one another like chess pawns, was happy to oblige. Christmas was one of the twin poles of our family culture, the other being summer vacations in Cape May, New Jersey, and both had a particular kind of Cold War Victorian sheen to them, eras made mythic through pop culture, replete with houses that, though haunted, were sumptuous and warm. My parents pulled my brother and me out of school one Friday every December to take the SEPTA train into Philadelphia, where we waited in line upon line an activity which normally brought out the worst tantrums in my impatient dad, but at this time of year, he drew upon some hidden reserves of calm for the sake of the kids, and if ever there was proof Christmas magic existed, it was this. First, we traversed the gleaming walls of the gallery, a mall like any other mall, except it stretched for blocks underground, a hidden city of lights beneath the smoggy city of brotherly love above, its slick tiled floors connecting the grand department stores, decked in old-world finery, their clothing displays topped with urns brimming with a forest worth of evergreen boughs and holly sprigs and bright glass beads that reflected the light in a million tiny points upon the ceiling around them. The treasure awaiting us at the heart of this capitalist maze, the Dickens Village in Wanamaker's. There, we strolled through a replica of London's cobblestone streets, peering into the windows of the row houses to see life-sized animatronic figures enacting famous scenes from A Christmas Carol. There was something wonderfully creepy about walking into the story like this, though that might also have been the herky-jerky empty-eyed robots. The climax with a trembling Ebenezer Scrooge throwing his rubbery hands up in fear before his own gravestone was truly frightening 
as the specter of the ghost of Christmas future hovered in the darkness above like a demented cousin of the grim reaper. And thunder cracked, and lightning strobed, and the tombstones closed in so that any semblance of divide between us and the story had dissolved. And God bless us everyone, my dad would say as we re-entered the light of Christmas Day. And even a heathen like me could agree. Next, we headed to the first floor to wait for Wanamaker's light show, a four-story high curtain of chintzy, multicolored marquises which enacted other familiar stories, Rudolph, Frosty, and my parents' favorite, the dance of the sugar plum fairies. They looked like someone's Christmas lawn display on steroids, bright colors blinking and flashing to tunes from a gigantic organ straight out of the Adams family. My parents used to sit among these very perfume and tie counters as kids, and they beamed to watch my brother and I now doing the same, finding it seemed some pleasure in the passage of time, rather than their typical complaints about encroaching age, and maybe even some comfort that something so basic, strings of lights, pre-recorded tunes we'd heard a million times already, could delight and amaze even in our technological day and age. Finally. We saw the man himself, Santa Claus, who, as I grew too big for his lap, requested I stand beside him instead. With our lists disgorged and future Christmas time happiness secured, we stormed the toy department, and I crammed myself into the monorail, which took you around the room's perimeter at the pace of a doddering priest and brought you close to the great and mysterious cosmos which spread in peeling paint across the ceiling. The vehicle was built for kindergartners, and my final year I developed a crick in my neck from folding my lanky, growth-spurting limbs into its seat. You're just too big, bud, Dad told me. I wanted to deny it, but even I could see. No one else on the ride had pimples and the ghost of a mustache but me. The reason for the season, as they said in Catholic school, played a small role in all of this, despite the Christ child's centrality in our religion lessons where the X in Xmas was as verboten as the X in X-rated movies. At home, we had a manger, tucked away in a windowsill, hidden by the leaves of my dad's goddamn amaryllis and crinkly foiled-covered pots of poinsettias, which I meticulously arranged. As I got older, the wise men might be chatting with their camels, or Joseph humping the sheep, but when younger, I liked the trio of angels just so, and Jesus in front of his mother and father, gazing upward with unfocused infant eyes full of bliss. This was my mom's manger, and when growing up, her dad liked it arranged speck too. My dad cared far more about the goddamn amaryllis. He grew a goddamn amaryllis every year, which, like my table setting preparations, began months in advance with the forcing of the bulb in October. He had one goal, to have his bloom before our neighbors. Claire was another adopted grandmother figure for me. And on Friday afternoons, when it was too cold for my dad to sit on the patio, we would head across the lawn to her house to watch Oprah. And as I became a teenager, drink coffee with Bailey's Irish cream or glasses of red wine. And for a while, strangely, blended fruit daiquiris. John, Claire would say, the more she drank, the longer she drew his name out. Well, you look at that. I haven't done a single thing, and that amaryllis is about to pop. Bullshit, my dad would say. He got stoned as a sinner to celebrate the weekend, though at the time I didn't know it. What are you feeding that goddamn amaryllis? Claire, red-faced and indignant, would slap her hands so hard on the table, the liquid in our drinks would vibrate. I am not feeding it anything. It just likes that window. Inevitably, my dad inspected the glass, prodded the soil, felt around for air currents of heat or cool, anything he could try to replicate at home in order to win the race, or any cheat she might be pulling off so he could cry foul. I get the same light you do, and my goddamn Amaryllis isn't doing shit. I don't know, John. It's a mystery. It's bullshit is what it is. You say tomato. This was Claire's style. She taught home economics to high school kids, and somehow things worked out for her always. At dinner parties, she'd get wasted and forget about the prime rib, but after yanking the batteries out of the screaming fire alarm, the meat ended up perfectly pink. She had a beautiful array of daffodils, the first ones to appear in spring, but she didn't weed them, deadhead them, nothing. And she made heavenly pies, 
with crusts that would flake apart and melt in your mouth because she never overworked them. She just let things be. One Saturday in December, Claire and Aunt Chooch and Uncle Joe, and usually Grandmom too, would pile into two cars and head to Longwood Gardens to tour the greenhouses and holiday displays. Longwood Gardens had the best goddamn amaryllises, heaps upon heaps of them, and pyramids of poinsettias, and topiaries trimmed like Rudolph with a single glowing red light for a nose, and a Christmas tree two stories high laden with glass and tin ornaments, and an even bigger organ than Wanamaker's, this one so big its pipes lined the walls of a room. A couple times my Aunt Nancy came with us, and we took her to the Christmas sing-along in that room where the vibrations from the treacly notes competed with your pulse, and all the grown-ups used their keys to replicate the sound of jingle bells. It gave me a headache, or else Aunt Nancy did. A devout Catholic nun, she expressed her disapproval as if she were smelling a fart, wrinkling her nose in judgmental righteousness, and her disapproval came often in our company. No good dad would talk like my dad talked around his kids. And no good kids would be more excited for Santa's flyover than they were Jesus' arrival, since one was a secular perversion and the other a bona fide miracle, though both Christ and Claus struck me as equally fantastical. And if anything, I believe more sincerely in the jolly big man, since there was certifiable proof of his visitation. Jesus was always a distant figure in my mind, a puppet of history made to say whatever the priests, nuns, and teachers at school wanted him to say, as the circumstances fit. Ironically, and Nancy and I share the same birthday, and that duality that we are linked by the happenstance of our births occupying the same square of calendar and yet couldn't be farther apart in personality made me squirm around her, as did kissing her. She shaved her mustache because not even she could pray away human vanity, and her stubble scraped like onion skin against my cheek. After one year in the organ room with Aunt Nancy, I spent the following years with my dad and Uncle Joe, who stalked the grounds under the skeletal branches of trees which had finally said goodbye to all vestiges of the verdant life they once knew, mumbling about stuck-up assholes who thought they knew better than everyone else when in fact they couldn't even think for themselves. Nuns were just handmaidens of the Pope. In my memory, the skies hung low above Longwood, the tree limbs black against an ashy smear of clouds that choked the sunlight, the silhouette of a bird was it a vulture, or could it be a phoenix, flying far and solitary, as if in a Wyeth painting? We'd visit the Brandywine River Museum on those days, too, home to many Wyeths in their muted beige and gray glory, like tears of longing wept on canvas. But we hadn't come for N.C. or Andrew or any of that family of painters. We'd come to see the miles of train tracks pretzeled on the second floor, patrolled by a fleet of O-gauge engines, electric and steam, freight-pulling and passenger-carrying, roaring express, or crawling with a hundred cars in their wake. The museum kept the kingdom of the trains dark, probably because the thickly forested hills, Rockwellian clapboard towns, and, strangely though this was steel country, forest uh, labyrinthine pipes of an industrial complex, were carpeted in a fine layer of dust, like frost on the fake grass of the valleys. Still, I loved wandering through this room, preferably alone, so I can imagine myself on one of those majestic trains, traversing the synthetic Americana of yesteryear, tumbling through cardboard mountains and over trestle bridges that spanned rivers of plastic, straining my eyes to find the ten figurines of Saint Nick, the chief engineer hid in the tableau. At the end of the day, there were lights limbing our long drive. There were always lights at Christmas time. That one time of year, the stars descended from the heavens to nestle themselves among the housing developments and strip malls of the suburban sprawl we called home. There were the tiny pinprick white ones my dad stickied his hands with as he wound them among the garland that festooned our front door and bay window. There were the thousands of rainbow orbs outlining the trees and topiaries at Longwood, their branches like the tentacles of technicolor octopi waving in the wind. And at Halford Track, where the rich people lived and battled one another for the coveted aluminum best decorated signs the township would post in your front yard, there were aggressive displays of not only adorned trees but life-size mangers cut from plywood and painted by hand, 
a workshop of animatronic Mickey Mouse's singing an off-key, off-tempo, off-brand version of It's a Small World After All. A broke-down VW punch buggy transformed into squat reindeer with antlers reaching for the sky, and numerous Delarobia, made of pineapples, pomegranates, limes, and pears, splayed above the front doors like the plumes of peacocks. They must have spent a fortune on that, my dad would say, as we drove along slowly at night blaring carols. Aunt Chooch, a cloud of naturally curly hair in the passenger seat beside him, while Mom sat back with me and my brother. Are they going to eat that fruit when they take it down? I can't get over it, Aunt Chooch would say, punctuating her disbelief with fingers like exclamation points in the air. You see that tree in the window? That's got to be over 10 feet tall. Can you imagine? At 25 foot, that's what? $250. Easy. My mom would wonder about the ornaments. Where do they keep it all? This is help for track, Aunt Chooch would say. They hire people to take care of that. Must be nice, my dad would say. And we all agreed. Then there were the illuminaires, small white paper bags with candles set inside them so that they glowed like the freshly confessed white kids in my school catechism book, their souls clean with the sacraments. The excitement of the illuminaire was that they appeared on a boring old Wednesday. So instead of Dad watching the local news in his sweatpants, Uncle Joe and Grandma came over, and we headed into the darkness for the candlelit, potpourri-smelling, mold cider-serving, bursting-with-product craft stores of Skipback, where an old man dressed like Father Christmas shook sleigh bells and wished us all a happy Christmas, while carolers in their finest Victorian tailcoats crooned about figgy pudding and wassail, foods we would never consume, but which we knew from these very songs taste it like the season itself, scrumptious. These stores sold nothing any typical American adolescent boy would love. Instead, catering to old crones, who favored lace doilies and porcelain figurines with frightening black eyes that never blinked, and for their square-shouldered, pot-bellied, mustachioed husbands, wooden mallards and golfers with no less sinister stares. Each year, my brother and I selected a new Christmas figure for our knick-knack collection, along with an ornament. For a while, the ornament slumbered in its bed of tissue paper, waiting while Dad spent an afternoon combing through the field of cut-your-own trees in order to find one with a platonically conical shape and rigid needles. Waiting, as each day he came home from work and methodically topped off the bucket of water it sat in so that its branches remained spry and green. Waiting, as he lugged the tree inside and with Mom's help wrapped its base in a plastic bag, which later they would zip around the woody corpse so as to cart old Tannenbaum out of the house without leaving behind a trail of needles, the end of the holiday's most potent symbol sealed here at its birth. Waiting as Dad and Mom affixed the angel on top and wrapped the limbs in lights, checking and rechecking to ensure the fat bulbs were all screwed in properly, letting out exclamations of Jesus Christ every time they burned their palms on one of the electric embers. Still waiting, though now in our hands, as my brother and I posed before the illuminated but bare limbs as Mom snapped a photo. And then, only then, finally, Thank the spirit of Christmas, could we hang our prizes upon the boughs. Dad did not take part in the tree trimming, but instead watched from the couch, spotting holes while drinking wine with Aunt Chooch. Down a little, Brian. No, more to your right. Uh, up, up. Yep, right there. Dad's work came later, once the final ball was hung. Then he draped tinsel on one thin strand of silver at a time those sturdy fingers surprisingly nimble, his sharp, critical eyes, a little buzz by this point, gone soft and dewy in the sugarcane light. As we festooned the tree, my brother counted and recounted the dated hallmark balls, incensed because I had more than him, not only because I was older, but because as the first child and grandchild on some years, I received duplicates. I can't say I helped in this. I'd pretend to find one of his, only to feign surprise when I realized it was yet another ball announcing baby's first Christmas, 1977. Though my parents counseled peace, not even the threat of making Santa's naughty list could stop our bickering. My brother was convinced I got special treatment, 
and one year wept because he tallied our holiday hall and found, if you count it, my Lord of the Rings box set as three books and not one present, that I had received more gifts than him. The fight for equality was one he felt impossible to win. But presents didn't come till after a weekend of cookie making, dozens upon dozens of chocolate chip with and without nuts for Uncle Joe, who despised walnuts, and oatmeal and shortbread and Russian tea balls, which I despised, and pecan sandies and these adorable little cookies Dad extruded from a kind of caulking gun that tested his patience once again and tasted mostly like the colored powdered sugar we drenched them in, and which no one really liked, and the gingerbread house building at Uncle Joe's, and the multiple trips to the mall and the state store for copious bottles of wine and bubbly, and the meticulous construction of plastic houses from my mom's childhood, which we arranged around the foot of the tree in yet another miniature idyllic holiday village of yesteryear, and encircled with tracks so our half-century-old Lionel train could drive the dog into fits of barking hysteria. Once these weekends, each one a story, had gone in their glory, and every golden door of my advent calendar hung ajar. Then it was Christmas Eve. Time for presents. Once again, we passed the morning in the kitchen, chopping all things fresh and pickled for the grand antipasto my mom laid out on a long silver tray, which only served this purpose. And since it could not fit in the fridge, was stored in the enclosed front porch to remain chill till dinner. Dad drove to the seafood store to be there when it opened yet still waited for upwards of an hour online, because we always ate fresh seafood at Christmas, not the seven fishes of Italian-American tradition, but a stew of shellfish or shrimp fra diavolo, which came to the table seasoned with the fear that Dad had gone too heavy on the hot peppers in his drunken rush to eat. In the afternoon, last-minute errands were run. Mom, who handled the family gift-buying, wanted for nothing. But Dad, who only had to get a present for Mom, often greeted the day empty-handed and in need of assistance. A good kid. I tried my best. Once, I accompanied him to a jeweler. What about this tennis bracelet, he said, showing me a thin gold chain. I didn't see the appeal or understand what the delicate-looking loop had to do with tennis, a sport I associated with running and grunting and sweat in which Mom didn't play. But I nodded, and he smiled, and then gave me the small velvet-lined box to wrap for him. Another time when I was in high school, he asked me and my girlfriend to get a mo my mom a teddy at Victoria's Secret. He didn't like going into that store because he wasn't sure where to put his eyes, and besides, the mall would be mobbed the afternoon of Christmas Eve. I selected an emerald green one because it matched the color of the dress my mom wore each Christmas, and I thought she looked pretty in it. I had no idea how to select the size, and when I turned to my girlfriend for help, she said, this is really weird. And later, I asked mom if she liked the present, and she blushed and didn't answer. And then I knew my girlfriend was right. It was weird. Once the presents were wrapped and dinner prepared, we waited again, as we'd been waiting all month. But now the waiting had weight to it. We felt it on our chests making our breath harder to come by, driving my head to distraction so I couldn't read or nap or do much of anything except bicker with my brother. That I could always do. Around five o'clock, Uncle Joe would arrive with Grandma, by which point we'd have belted and zipped ourselves into our finest for mass. My brother and I would exchange a present, meant to tide us over till the gift-giving orgy to come, a strategy with, which often backfired because we gave one another toys and then would want to bring the new toy with us to mass or else stay home entirely with Uncle Joe, who said his blaspheming ass would be struck by the fury of God if he entered church, to drink wine and cuddle the dog and start the pasta water. It wasn't that the mass itself was terrible, actually because the hymns were familiar carols and there was a life-size nativity I loved to look at and imagine might begin walking down the aisle, donkey neighing and sheep braying, and the holly and the garlands and all the trappings of Christmas distracted you from the dour images of Christ's crucifixion. It was about as pleasant as Mass got. It was just so crowded. Anyone with a stitch of sense would attend Christmas Eve Mass, which became so popular it happened in both the upper and lower church simultaneously, sometimes because Dad hated arriving an hour early to squeeze into a pew. We stood through it all, and I mean all, because while we usually left early at Holy Communion, devout Grandmom demanded we stay through the final procession. 
This meant the parking lot was like something out of Mad Max. And my dad, his patience utterly depleted by now, Christmas time be damned, accumulated a multitude of sins and stern looks from Grandma by driving aggressively, cutting people off, screaming out the window at the fucking assholes who cut him off, and generally endangering our and everyone else's life in his ravenous rush to return home for what was for a family who typically sat down at five o'clock, a very late dinner. Let's remember the holiday spirit, my mom sitting in the back with us would remind him. Fucking hungry, he'd grumble, unable to even speak in a complete sentence or without swearing. By this point, none of us had eaten since breakfast, so our appetites weren't just primed. They were feral. When we arrived home, the first thing Dad did was pour himself a large glass of red wine to calm his nerves. Aunt Chooch would be there, and Claire, too, with gifts arranged not just under the tree, but spreading out in a field of gilded wrapping throughout the living room. For years, everyone exchanged with everyone else, so there'd be something like 40 or 50 presents, which we opened one by one over a dessert of cookies and spiked coffee. Uncle Joe's gifts were the most elaborately bedazzled. He'd stay up late the night before, wrapping and re-wrapping until they were perfect, the corners true and sharp, scotch tape hidden, and attaching a smaller gift, an ornament, a puppet, a piece of art, to the outside of each one, a present before the present, like an appetizer, in true Victorian style. When he was old enough, my brother laid a fire, a special treat since Mom hated cleaning the ashes, but it was but once a year. Then it was time for toast and antipast, during which olives and beets went around the table as people picked out what they didn't want and made bargains for the things they coveted more of, usually meats and cheeses. And we talked about the masses who arrived early for church and to queue for fresh bread and cannolis down in Little Italy. Weren't those people insane for freezing their asses off in line like that? I helped Dad plate the seafood. And as I got older, turned the shrimp as they fried, though I flinched every time the moisture in their shells boiled and caused the oil to pop on my fingers. While Dad, impervious with alcohol, seared red polka dots onto his hands and salted the dish with sweat. Aunt Chooch and Mom, as usual, did clean up, while Grandma and Claire, the matriarchs, did whatever the hell they wanted, which meant extra glasses of wine and cookies and luxurious chocolates from Philadelphia that Aunt Chooch brought special and sometimes letting farts and burps slip out at the table. Though no one mentioned it when they did, we only held our lips tight and smiled at one another knowingly. The sloppy body was forgiven on this special night. When the gifts with the gifts opened and the gorgeous wrapping paper stuffed into the trash, my brother and I slipped into our pajamas as everyone left, then came down to lay out cookies and milk for Santa and a carrot for Rudolph, and to hang our stockings above the ember-filled fireplace, still radiating a cozy heat that made the rest of the house deliciously cold. We slept together that night, for years, even as teenagers, and Mom and Dad read Twas the Night Before Christmas to us, then disappeared downstairs to drunkenly arrange the presents. Once I heard them driving the dog crazy, because, I later found out, they brought my brother a remote-controlled car. John, stop it, Mom would say. You're going to wake the kids. Then a motor whirled and the dog growled and barked as they laughed. And though I had no idea what was happening down there, everything felt all right. In the quiet, dim hours delineating Christmas Eve from day, my brother slept. Usually I stayed up past my parents, and throughout the night I would be in and out of a fitful, dream-filled slumber, watching the colored lights which I left on around my Christmas village and keeping an ear turned to the roof for the clump of hooves. One year I heard mom using the bathroom and then I got up too and she told me she had heard a jingle bell. Had I also heard it? I was sure I had. The real magic of that night was that I slept at all, but I did. And whether I awoke before six or closer to seven, the night passed and the dawn arose once once more from the ashes of twilight. Christmas had arrived. Dad went downstairs first to put the coffee and carols and tree lights on and to take photos as we descended the steps in our pajamas. There, in two piles by the tree, lay our presents, which mostly came unwrapped and unboxed, as if not from the factory or store, but direct from Santa's workshop, still sticky with the candy cane fingerprints of elves. Those grand castles of molded plastic for He-Man and Thundercats, the new additions to my Star Wars army, 
the many feet of track down which soared a fleet of hot wheels, the thousands of shiny Lego bricks, the stacks of VHS tapes, comic books, and novels, though later we might tire of them or find them disappointing. In that morning light, with our parents perched above us on the couch, sipping coffee and munching toast, were childhood distilled. Those thrilling adventure stories always turned out okay in the end. The pieces fit together just so, and when they didn't, they could be forced into place by Dad's strong fingers. Christmas morning was a time of closeness and gentleness, broken once memorably by my dad announcing after our stockings had been emptied and all the presents revealed, Oh, Pa, your hamster's dead. In the silence that followed, my brother's face fell and his eyes filled with tears. But then I announced, Merry Christmas! And my parents laughed, though he got mad at them for doing so, and me for joking at his dear pet's expense. But this too was the essence of our particular patch of kiddom. After the morning quiet gave way to an afternoon matinee of whatever cartoon classic Disney had released from their vault that year, during which Dad napped off his hangover, we headed to Uncle Joe's for dinner. Here, the snacks laid out on various end tables were loaded with cream and salted pork, and the house smelled of the fresh evergreen boughs that blanketed the mantelpiece, and of roasting meat, and of decades' worth of cigarette tar, which caked the walls so that nothing looked pure white like snow. It all seemed sepia-toned. The blazing fire made the living room swelter, but the drafty windows kept the rest of the cottage so cold my mom's lips turned blue. You could actually see your breath in the downstairs bathroom, which had no heat, and it was hard to pee like that, and worse if you sat down. A haze hung near the ceiling from this gathering of pack-a-day smokers, so it seemed like we really had stepped back in time, to an age of candles and gas lights and London smog. Grandma held court in an armchair by the hearth, her daughters sitting near. Stout Aunt Kathy, cheeks candy apple red, Phlegm throated, it, never able to catch her breath, and yet still, though it looked like she might literally keel over with every note, belting out show tunes to fit the occasion or rile Uncle Joe. And skinny Aunt Marine, whom I called Aunt Beans due to some syllabic mix-up from an early age, who drank her light beer with an ice cube, and not unlike Uncle Joe, seemed always a little tired by the world. Both sisters talked a streak, and neither did much to help their brother, who had been toiling away most of the night in the kitchen, and toiled still in front of the stove, interrupted only by my dad, who, in an oft-repeated routine, would goose Joe from behind while he looked into the oven and ask, When we eatin'? And what's for dessert? And Uncle Joe, who at first would reply, Did you eat yet? would eventually say, Oh, go to hell. And finally, as the snacks disappeared and the meat still wasn't done, Oh, John, just get the fuck out of my kitchen. After gorging myself on Aunt Kathy's artichoke dip, because again, we hadn't eaten lunch, I left the adults to their cackling and coughing and oogling of the tree and helped do what I could, laying the table, uncorking wine, filling water jugs, and piling napkin-lined baskets with the yeasty, yeasted sticky buns Uncle Joe's sisters insisted he make, though they sat in your stomach like a hard lump of regret and stuck to the cloth so that they sometimes came stippled with cotton pills. In that hectic, hairy time, Uncle Joe passed on what wisdom he could about cooking, how freezing a metal bowl made cream whip faster, and a dollop of mustard gave dimension to gravy, and carrots and everything from sauce to a casserole added a light sweet note to a meal. My brother helped too, and with the shared goal of dinner before us, we worked together in harmony. When the time came, I ferried dishes to the table, then called the hungry masses to sup. If possible, I sat next to Uncle Joe, or Kathy's husband, Uncle Ed, a giant of a man, with a pot belly as large as an eight-year-old child, an incarnation of the ghost of Christmas present, and a cynical son of a bitch, who would join my dad in gently ribbing Joe, though sometimes the jokes had a bit of edge to them, since Joe, unlike all the other t adults at the table, didn't work but stayed home ostensibly making art, though mostly keeping house. And in this group of people who had only recently left the working class from the middle, this kind of devotion to both art and home seemed a sign of laziness in a man, or worse, pompousness. After a toast to the holiday and family, we each took hold of one end of a Christmas crackle, cracker and pulled till they snapped. Inside the ripped tubes, we found the corniest jokes 
which Uncle Ed and my dad always managed to turn dirty, like adding in bed at the end of a fortune cookie aphorism, and crepe paper crowns which we adorned ourselves with, and cheap toys that often broke as you assembled them. Afterward, there were more cookies. No one made shortbread like Uncle Joe. They melted into delicate pats of butter on your tongue, like what I thought a communion wafer should do. And if she was drunk enough, which she almost always was, Aunt Kathy would sing carols and songs from theater shows I had never heard of, sucking hard on a cigarette in between every chorus and washing it all down with more wine the color of her face. We had celebrated with my dad's family the weekend before, and on Boxing Day we would visit my mom's family. But throughout the season, during which I see now, my parents did create for us a kind of time-traveling, scale-shifting, dreaming-while-awake, walking-through-a-winter-wonderland of synthetic snow magic, our family was who we chose it to be. It was because of this that for years in my adolescence, I kept a small shrine to Christmas in my year room year-round, my favorite nutcrackers, snow globes, and needlepoints, which I carefully removed from the shelf each Saturday to dust, calculating how many weeks and days and hours until this small collection would be rejoined with their brothers and sisters in the attic and Christmas would begin again. But no magic can still the march of time. But my senior year in high school, Grandma greeted us on Thanksgiving morning with the sagging, asymmetrical smile of someone who had recently recovered from a stroke. Her once sharp eyes now looked at the breakfast table laid before her as if through a window obscured with musty linen drapery. A few weeks into the new year, she died, and at her funeral, my dad cried like I had never seen him cry before or since, as I never knew him capable of crying. And then mom wept, and finally I broke down, knowing that something had changed, had shifted, had ended. At the time, I didn't know that thing was childhood, and Christmas, and also Uncle Joe, in the years that followed, when he didn't need to caretake for anyone except the person he was least capable of caring for, himself. Joe took to living in his cold, dusty television room on a steady diet of cigarettes and rot-gut wine. After months of this, my mom found his quaint kitchen a wreck, windows wide open to the squirrels who came in to steal scraps from the sink, and Joe on the couch, nearly dead from drink. She visited him almost every day while he was in the hospital, and then the psych ward, begging his sisters to intervene. But this, they thought, was nothing they could do anything about. Joe always had a nervous, sensitive temperament. He never lived in the real world. He was an artist, for Christ's sake, a failed artist. As if to prove their point, Joe attempted suicide again. My parents couldn't forgive them their callousness, or for when they evicted Joe and sold the cottage and our adopted family fell apart. Eventually, I stopped coming home for the holiday because it no longer felt like one at all. The magic now had strings attached. You couldn't give yourself over to the tricks without feeling, well, tricked. And so I pack these memories away like the gold and silver holiday decorations, the fantasy villages and porcelain angels, the familiar songs and stories and only revisit them when the calendar has no more pages to turn, and a new one rises to take the old one's place upon the wall. That was the dreariest day as a child, the returning of the cardboard boxes to the attic's everlasting night, the resumption of normalcy once the New Year's revels came to an end. The year was frightening in its infancy, and the monotonous winter stretched before us like childhood, silent and brittle and cold, and on those dark charcoal mornings, our dreams didn't leave our lips, but remained in our heads, ours alone with which to contend. Thank you.